Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Well, today it's my pleasure to introduce Blaise Aguera y Arcas. Um, Blaise uh, is currently the CTO and president of a startup called Sand Codex, and he's going to be meeting with some product groups later today to show some of the really exciting technology that they're doing, which I don't know how much I'm allowed to even describe now, so I won't, I won't talk about it now. But he's going to talk today about something completely different, um, which is his PhD work uh, at Princeton which he's, he's a postdoctoral candidate. I guess he'll be getting his PhD this uh, academic year um, in computational, was it applied in computational mathematics. And this work is, is on his discovery of Gutenberg's original printing processes using computational methods. And it's been the subject of a BBC documentary, and it's been published in Nature. And um, I'm really happy to have Blaze here to describe it to you today. Blaze. Thanks, David. <clears throat> so, um, I know this is a little bit uh, a little bit out of the out of the usual for uh, for the, for talks that that get given here probably, but um, uh, I'd like to just quickly introduce my, my collaborators with this work. Uh, one of them is um, Paul Needham, who is the the Shady Librarian at Princeton University. Uh, the the Shady Library is a is a, a small rare books library inside Princeton's uh, main rare books library, and it's a it's a fantastic collection. It has probably the best collection of the earliest printing in the West. Uh, in the entire in the entire hemisphere, so I, I, it's really been my, my privilege to work with him. He's a kind of world Gutenberg expert. Uh, Adrian Fairhall has done parts of this work with me. She's she's my uh, my wife, and she's also on the faculty at UW. And um, uh, major parts of this work were supported by by William Scheide, the the owner of that uh, of that little library within a library. So when when um, people think about Gutenberg, this is usually the object that's attached to that name. This is the, the Gutenberg Bible, uh, the 42-line Bible. Uh, that's, that distinguishes it from the 36-line Bible, which is actually a kind of rarer object and was also printed um, using Gutenberg's types. But uh, we'll, we'll maybe get to that a little bit later. This is the, the famous one. Uh, and um, it's, it's unsigned and undated. Uh, all of Gutenberg's work is. Uh, everything everything about, about his work is actually shrouded in a kind of mystery. But, uh, but we have all kinds of strong circumstantial evidence. This was printed by him in Mainz, Germany, around 1455. And uh, we think about this as the first, the first book, the first printed book. So major milestone. Uh, one, of the, one of the astonishing things about this, and of course there's a copy in the Shadi Library, one of the astonishing things about this book is that, uh, is that it's very, very beautifully typeset. Um, we'll, hopefully we'll get to some, some close-ups later on. Um, I, I can't remember whether I included them, but... Uh, this, this doesn't look like a first effort at all. It looks like a very polished piece of printing, and in fact it is. Um, this is, um, is more like what we believe to be the earliest surviving piece of printing. Uh, this is a, a fragment. It survives only, uh, only in one copy, uh, which is in Berlin. Uh, this is unlike the, um, the Gutenberg Bible, of which there are, um, I, would, I would guess, at least 40 copies surviving. Um, so that was, that was 1455. This is probably sometime between 1448 and 1450, although the dates are, the dates are, very, um, are very unclear. And it's a fragment from an apocalyptic poem uh, called the, the Sibylin book. Uh, this is, what, what you're seeing is, is, all that, is all that survives, and it's, uh, it's much, much cruder printing than the Gutenberg Bible. Uh, there are lots of differences. Um, for example, in, in, this, um, in this printing, there are no current types. Uh, I probably don't need to explain to this group what that, what that means, but there are no types that fit underneath other types. Everything, everything has a, f a square footprint, a rectangular footprint. And uh, you can see that the, the typography is very uneven. There are letters that, that seem to, to jitter up and down and side to side, and uh, some letters are impressed strongly and others weakly and so on. This, is, this, this looks more like the kind of first effort that one would expect from the, the very dawn of printing. These kind of survivals are very, very rare and fragmentary. There, there are just a few things from Gutenberg's press in this, in this early pre-Bible period. Uh, so the interesting thing about, um, about, that, about the Sibylin book, as well as the, the crudeness of the typography, is that it's not in the same font 
as the um, as the 42 line Bible. It's in a font that's uh, that's usually called DK, uh, Donatus Calendar, for for uh, two other fragmentary survivals from that period. Uh, Donatus was a was a Latin a Latin primer, and the, the calendar is the Turkan calendar, which was with, uh, well, was a fundraiser for the church, uh, issued in the form of a, of a calendar, um, an astronomical calendar, and. So this type is, is maybe 30% bigger than the Bible type, and it's much cruder. Um, in the Shadi Library, there's, there's one piece of printing that uh, it also survives in a unique copy, and it's printed also in the DK type. It's, uh, it was printed a year later than the Bible, uh, 1456, but it uses that same first type. Uh, as a, this is the DK type as opposed to the B42 type. And so this was, uh, was the main subject of, of a lot of the analysis that I did on Gutenberg's earliest printing. Uh, it's, it's called the, the Bulla Turcorum, or Calixtus Bull. And uh, it's, it's also very important historically. This was the papal bull that announced the fall of Constantinople to the Turks uh, earlier in the decade. So pivotal, uh, pivotal historical thing that happened and, and, a, and a pivotal uh, piece of printing because it's, um, again, survives in a single copy and it's printed using the first type ever, ever made in the West. Um, the, the typesetting is not as crude as, uh, as the Sibylin book. Uh, this is a, a, probably a revised version of that same type. So I'm skipping ahead now about 50 years. This is, this is 1501. It's a, it's a woodcut uh, from a, a dance macabre printed in uh, Lyon. And so it's an allegory about how, how death takes everybody. There are a series of woodcuts of different, uh, different trades, different kinds of tradesmen being taken by death unexpectedly. Uh, the reason, the reason I, I bring this up is because it's actually the first, um, the first primary evidence that we have um, about how printing actually happened. Uh, there, there are lots of, lots of books and, uh, um, uh, and talks given about early printing, printing that first 50 years between 1450 and 1500, um, very critical period in, in intellectual history in the West. Uh, but most of them don't, uh, don't point out that we actually have no primary evidence about how printing took place in that first 50 years at all. Uh, it, was, uh, um, it was a trade, and uh, technologies and trades during that period were controlled by, uh, by, by guilds and by artisans who were very secretive about their processes. So uh, we know virtually nothing about Gutenberg's life except through, through a very few kind of legal documents. We'll talk a little bit more about those later. And we know nothing about the, about the actual processes that he used. Everything we know about Gutenberg's printing really has to be inferred from, uh, from the surviving printing itself. There's no other data. There's no, uh, um, uh, there's no document that says, this is how I did it. So um, it's, it's just worth pointing out here what's, what's happening. The, um, the guy on the left is, a, a, um, is using a compositing stick to, to, com to compose lines of type from, from a type case from, from a fair copy. Um, in the middle are two pressmen working a, working a press. They're, they're actually printing from forms onto paper. And then on the right, on the right hand side is the bookseller. And uh, usually booksellers in this period just, just, sold the, um, just sold the printed sheets. It was the customer's responsibility to go out and have them bound and then illuminated or rubricated or, uh, or worked in some artisanal way after that. So it's not, it's not Amazon.com days yet. Um, OK. so. One thing we do know, we do certainly know about about this about this earliest printing is that it was printed from movable types, just like uh, um, uh, just like in this um, in this picture. Now, the process of printing from movable types, just a quick quick review: you cast uh, a, a large set of, of types, lots of copies of every lowercase a, lowercase b, and so on, and uh, you use those types to um, uh, to set up a form, which um, so they're, they're type positives that are reversed. You ink that with these inking balls. That's what the guy in the background is doing. This is a, a, a leather ball that's, that, that you, you, uh, you fill with ink, and then you, you ink up the surface, and then you press the paper onto it. So there are several different, um, several different mechanized processes here. Uh, one of them is, of course, just the mass production of the, of the printed sheets of paper from that form. But, but probably the more important mass production happening here is the mass, the mass production of the types themselves. That's also a mass production process. And that's really the one that I'm going to be focusing on today. Um, the, the printing part, where you, you have the, print, the inked surface and you print many copies, uh, had, had been around for a long time uh, before Gutenberg, even in the West. There, were, there, were, there was woodcut printing um, almost 50 years before. Um, playing cards were probably being produced in a similar way and so on. So 
Uh, here's, here's some very simple evidence that, that the thing was, uh, that the Calixtus bull, which is the object that I primarily studied, was printed from movable type. This is, uh, um, this character is, uh, is actually a PER. There, there are lots of scribal shorthands in, in printing from this period, something that we'll return to. Um, it's, it's not an ordinary P because of that foot at the bottom. Uh, but the thing to notice is that, uh, is that this, this one is damaged or, or strange in some way, and that damage has been corrected scribally afterward. Okay, that's, that's an ink stroke through the bottom. So Calixtus Bull is about, um, uh, about 24 pages long, and here that same PER recurs a few pages later, and again, and again. So there are a total of four occurrences of this, of this damaged type. These have been uh, aligned by, by cross-correlation, and I'm just, I'm just giving you um, the, the context around each of those occurrences of the PER. So this is interesting because you can, you can actually see a damage type recurring in, inside, uh, inside the same printed document. They're about four pages apart. Uh, that tells you something about the cycle, of, uh, about the typographic cycle that was being used here. The, the type case was big enough, or the, um, or the, the period uh, between the time when you, you set up the types you print, you break them down, you, you clean the types, you put them back in the case, and then you set them up into a new page. It seems to have been around four pages. Uh, so this is the reuse of the, same, of the same type to print the next page. Now, one of the consequences of the whole movable type theory, of course, is, is that you should never see two occurrences of the same damage type on the same page. And the type can't be in two places at once. And, and you probably don't expect it to see on two consecutive pages either. That would, be, uh, that would suggest too rapid a, a turnover. Okay, so there's, there's that, damage, that damaged PER. So let's talk a little bit about how the, how the types actually get made. And this is a process that was thought to have, uh, to have originated uh, with Gutenberg and to have remained more or less in t completely unchanged until the middle of the 19th century. This is a very, very long period in which the technology was supposed to, was supposed to be just constant. The idea, and uh, this is from... Uh, um, this is from an, an engraving of, of Du Verger, who's much, uh, much later, 18th century. Um, the idea is that you start off with, uh, with a punch. Uh, actually, I'll show some close-ups of those pieces later. Um, you start off with a steel punch uh, that's been engraved by hand with the positive of, of every letter, like the lowercase a. Uh, you strike that, that steel punch into a copper matrix, and then you use that copper matrix to you, you insert that copper matrix into a uh, into a typecasting mold, and uh, and you cast lots of uh, lots of lead type from that mold. It's a um, an alloy of lead. So the guys on the on the left hand side of this picture are using those typecasting molds to cast lots of lots of copies of lead letters. The boys in the middle are breaking off the jets. I'll I'll, I'll explain what I mean by that in a second. And uh, and then the craftsmen on the right hand side are finishing. The, the types. Um, you, you have to do a little bit of filing and, and cleaning up of the, of the edges of the quad in order to get things to align properly. So here are the parts. This is the punch. Uh, it starts off as a, as, a steel, uh, as a solid steel block, and you carve away the negative space. This is, this is going to be very important later on. Uh, so in other words, the printing surface is the original uh, front face of the steel punch, and you carve away the, the part that isn't there. There's the punch having been struck into a matrix. And there's uh, and there's the mold. So you you put the mold into uh, you put the, the matrix into the mold. You pour the, the molten metal in the top, and and the place where you poured turns into this jet, which you have to break off. That's what that's what's shown on the bottom. This is what Gutenberg is credited with having invented. This is the um, the the key technology that distinguishes printing from movable types from printing from wood blocks or other any other kind of printing that already existed at the at the time of uh, at the time of his. That he, that he arrived on the scene in the, in the 1440s, 1450s. Okay, uh, this I think we'll, we'll kind of skip ahead with, but uh, maybe it's worth mentioning. There, there has been some controversy historically about whether Gutenberg invented that, that, uh, that process that Duverger described or not. Um, this, is, uh, this, this is part of a kind of alternative cookie theory that was presented by, uh, by, by some, um, some German researchers in the 30s and 40s. Um, Never mind about the details of this theory, but, but there were other theories about what that earliest typography, how those earliest types were made, but a lot of that research was actually, uh, was actually conducted by, uh, by German and Dutch researchers before the Second World War, 
um, and they they had uh, um, they had access to grind. Uh, a lot of it had to do with nationalism or with trying to prove that the Dutch invented it first or refute that. Or you know, there's lots of lots of nationalist controversy, and all of this stuff more or less died out with the Second World War. After that. Um, the whole question of, of how, type, how the first types were made just, just seemed to disappear, uh, probably because a number of the researchers died. Um, and it, it hasn't really been revisited since until, until this work. Um, maybe also because there just hasn't been any, any new evidence that has come into play. Everybody's just assumed. OK, so uh, what, what I set out to do in collaboration with Paul in, in, um, in 1998, 99, was originally just, uh, it was a simple enough project, I thought. Uh, I just wanted to make um, what is called a synopsis of the first uh, type, of the first typeface in the West. And um, by synopsis, what I mean is um, uh, reconstruct the font. You, you want to know what, what is the original image of every letter, of every, of every character in that typeface. Uh, you want to be able to reconstruct that from the, from the printed document. So uh, not, not coming from a rare books background myself, I thought that would be a pretty easy job. Uh, it's just a kind of clustering, you know, clustering. I mean, you shouldn't even need to cluster. You should be able to just do it by, by, by looking, more or less. And um, just looking is more or less what, uh, what Paul and a collaborator of his, Janet Ng, had tried to do in the 80s. Uh, it's, it's actually kind of surprising that this hadn't been done before the 80s. You know, this is the first Western typeface. It's a very, very important thing. We want to know what that typeface is. Uh, so he and, and one of his collaborators who were preparing a facsimile edition of the Calixtus Bull tried to do just this. And they spent many, many months trying to figure this out from this 24-page document. What is, the, what is the, the, the set of characters? The fact that it was so complicated was kind of an interesting thing. Um, they, um, this is as far as they got with that, with that project before it stalled. Um, so this was the, right, the, the last version. It was, almost, it was almost the final version. And there, there are a bunch of anomalies here. Uh, one of the things you might notice right away is that the character set is very big. It's it's much bigger than one would expect from a, a from an ordinary um, from an ordinary character set. There are a number of reasons for that. Um, one of them is that typography in this in this period, in fact, writing in this period is very very complex. It's not at all like like modern writing in which there's one version of every letter uh, or maybe two. There's an uppercase and a lowercase, and that's it. Uh, it's much more complex. You you have uh, these these spiny shapes. And uh, there's, there are ideas about the rhythm of the vertical strokes, which are called minims. And different versions of the letters are used depending on what letter they, they, they precede or follow in order to keep that sense of rhythm. Uh, there are also all these ligatures that started off as scribal shorthand. And the, the scribal shorthand comes from, uh, comes from the period just a few decades earlier when all writing in Europe was happening on vellum. And one of the things to keep in mind about vellum is that every page is a sheep. So uh, it matters to save space. Uh, anything that you can do to pack in more text into a smaller space is good. So uh, that's where a lot of these scribal shorthands and the sense of, of, of rhythm and of packing, this Gothic look of typography really, or of writing from that period really comes from. So there are lots of, lots of shorthands. You'll notice all these things like E's with overbars or A's with tildes on them and so on. Those are all shorthands. That E with overbar probably stands for an E-N or E-M. But a lot of those are context dependent too. You, know, you, you have to actually read it in context to see what word it is. There are strange symbols that are short for um, R-U-M, for example. This one that's, uh, that's, that comes after the R's, R9, that's R-U-M. Um, there are lots of, lots of complicated symbols that are combinations of types or versions of the letters that, 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 that come in a certain context. But even, even accounting for all of those kinds of, of, uh, of semantic differences between the different types, there are still more types here than there should be, more, more, uh, more images than there should be of different kinds of types. But those are the ones that I've highlighted in, in yellow here. These are versions of, of each letter that are theoretically identical. They serve exactly the same function. They're completely interchangeable. They don't have any aesthetic or graphic difference between them, they, but they just appear to be different glyphs. So that's, that's kind of a mysterious thing. Here I'm, I'm reproducing some of them um, big. These are, these are E's and U's. That's U.S. on the bottom. So um, the groups here represent letters that are functionally the same. There's, there's an E with spines. There's an E with spines and overbar an E with spines and tilde. Uh, then the second row is all E without spines. This is to follow letters that protrude out to the right. Um, but there's absolutely no reason for there to be more than one E with tilde and spines. Those, those are all the same letter. And yet you can see that they're clearly very different. They, they clearly didn't come from the, same, uh, from the same mold, from the same matrix. 
and that's that's the the kind of surprising thing. It's surprising because uh, a steel punch takes a whole day to carve. Uh, it's it's a, a tremendous amount of work to carve a steel a steel punch. That's the work intensive part. Um, there's no reason why once you once you've carved the steel punch, why you can't cast an, an infinite number of, uh, of of lead types from that thing. Basically, Not infinite but very large. You can strike several matrices with it. Every matrix can cast many many types. So why would there be uh, these strange duplicates? Can you tell us what different matrices cast from the same punch? Uh, that's that's actually a more complicated question than it sounds. We'll get to. I, Keep the question in mind. We'll come back to it. How much noise there is in all of these measurements? The noise is the critical question. That's the critical question. Uh, so, but just, just by looking at these things by eye, I, maybe we can start to address that noise issue. Uh, so, for example, look at the E's with the tildes in the top right. Um, clearly, the, the transformation going from the first E with tilde to the second E with tilde is not something that could arise from any ordinary noise that we can imagine. Right? Because the entire tilde has, been, has changed shape, and they're both nice crisp impressions, but they just have a totally different shape. You can't, can't really imagine the, um, the lead deforming in that way, or, or uh, even less, the copper deforming in that way. The whole thing has moved, moved and changed shape. So, it looks, well, that, that, that was the assumption that two punches must have been used. Well, OK, in this case, right, there's the interesting question of could a, a different punch have been used for the overbar? That's right. So that's yet another, yet another important question. Uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll be coming back to that one, too. Um, but I, I show this one just for, uh, just as an example. There are other cases here where the, where the differences are clear, even among letters that that that, uh, that are a single form, not a single ink, ink island or connected component. Okay, so uh, some of the analysis that I started doing relies on on uh, on some fairly fairly fancy uh, sort of high resolution photography of these uh, uh, um, of the pages of the Callistus bull. So I got together a bunch of hardware to take these these high resolution scans, and one of the one of the processes that I started working on in the beginning was to, to reconstruct the actual impression of the type into the paper. Uh, the impressions are deep. You can actually read them almost by braille. Uh, it's a nice soft rag paper. The impression is strong. Uh, the ink is also very, very thick and sticky. And one of the, one of the results of that is that, um, is that the inked impression actually extends beyond the boundaries of the, uh, of the actual impression that the type makes. This is yet another source of noise. Um, so uh, over here, this is this is kind of an, uh, a cute, cute analysis. I'm not, I'm not this this actually this image, in fact, has a couple of problems with it, but but it, it gives you the idea. The analysis here involved um, photographing the same thing with the light source in different places, and then uh, and then doing a uh, doing a transform. Paper is a, is a very good Lambertian surface, meaning that uh, that its its um, its brightness just looks like the cosine of the of the angle between the light source and the viewer. And so if you do a little bit of math, you can, you can actually reconstruct the three-dimensional surface, like a bump map of the surface of the page from, uh, from, from three or four uh, different, differently lit versions of the thing. And you can actually see the impression of the type uh, nestled inside the, uh, the ink that spills over the, uh, over the boundaries. And you can see here that if you look from a distance, this looks like, uh, um, well, actually, here I've, here, here I've lit it very strongly. So you can sort of see that the apostrophe and the Q are different. Um, but you can see it very clearly when you look at the three-dimensional version. Uh, the apostrophe and the Q uh, start off start off as, as possibly different types, or at least disconnected components, and they only they only fuse when you um, uh, when the ink uh, when there's capillary ink filling up the gap. Um, okay, so I'll, I'll show you the, the quality of the raw data that I was working with. This is um, this is the first page of the bull, and um, and this is the resolution of those images. So. Um, so it's quite high. It's high enough to do uh, that, that, that we're not limited by noise in the in the scanning. So uh, I'll, I'll just I'll just show you in schematic the, some of the some of the processing that, that I did on this stuff. Uh, the first thing, of course, is to isolate the ink and get rid of all the rubricating ink, the, the red stuff, and and the and the variations in the paper. Okay. So then then we uh, we can do a we can do a kind of fuzzy binarization, and we get um, uh, we get connected components. So connected components meaning islands, islands of ink in the, uh, in, the, in the sea of paper. OK, here are all the connected components from the first page sorted by mass. And uh, of course, lots of, lots of letters consist of a single connected component. So right away, we get, uh, we get the images of a bunch of letters out of this, out of this very simple process. A's, S's, U's, and so on. Obviously, connected components isn't perfect, though. 
and it's especially imperfect with this early printing. So here's, uh, here are some cases in which the stickiness of the ink caused connected components to fail because, different, uh, because adjacent characters have, uh, have ink between them and end up becoming a single island. So that's one of the ways this can fail. Uh, also, things that should be single, single islands can break up into multiple islands, as almost happened over here, because of the very spiny character of this kind of, of, this kind of printing. It's not like modern, uh, modern letters that almost all have, uh, you know, uh, are, are solid. It's a, a nice solid shape. In this case, a lot, of the, a lot of the typographic design relies on things touching only at, uh, uh, only at a point. So it's very easy for things to break up. And then, of course, there are lots of cases where, there's, uh, where there, there clearly was one piece of type, but there are two or more uh, connected components get, that get formed out of that. In, in, uh, in the modern Roman alphabet, there aren't too many of those. In, in English, there's only the I and the J, I think, the lowercase i and J. But in, in Gutenberg's font, of course, there are tons of these things because of all of those shorthands and, and, and fancy characters. So those obviously all get broken up. Uh, now, so all of those cases are kind of trivial things that you just, you just you know, are obviously going to be shortcomings of a connected components type method. But it gets a little bit more complicated, uh, again, because of, because of the eccentricities of this, of this, um, this kind of printing. So here, um, it's actually not clear, for example, where that tilde in venerabilibus, which is what that top word is, uh, where that tilde belongs. Is it part of the E or part of the A? So this is one of the, one of the cases in which you start to start to be unsure about how, how these actually should be clustered. You have to do something a little more sophisticated than, than just, um, just connect components. So one more question, I'm sorry, just ask questions. Of course. So this is using the earlier type, but not with the rectangular bounding box. Uh, ah, so that's one of the very important things that happened between the Sibylline book and the Calixtus bull. So the Calixtus bull does have, uh, does have some current sorts. Um, so yeah, obviously, if everything were rectangular, the job would be much easier, right? Um, so that wasn't the case of the, of the Callistus bull anymore. This was, uh, it was much better typography than the, than the Sibylline book. Clearly, it had been a, a recasting of that same type, but you could still see sorts that clearly came from the earlier version. So it's the same type, but in a later state. Okay, so these are lots of examples of, of, of cases where we actually don't know how the thing should be clustered at all. You know, this, this word, feribus, uh, you know, third row, right-hand side, you know, we, we don't really know that FRI, you know, how many, how many sorts that was exactly. It's not clear. You have to, we have to do something further to figure it out. In Victoria. So you can find some cases in which um, you get a hint, like there's a DE ligature. Um, and uh, you, can, you can see clearly the DE ligature actually does consist of two sorts because once in a while that, that cutoff D appears in a place that it shouldn't, like, like uh, next to the A instead of the E. So... Um, uh, can everybody see what I mean? That's, that's, a, that's a, a strange form of D that's only designed to be used uh, in front of an E. This is an example of one of those strange, you know, one of those types that's only designed for a particular context. Of course, a lot of a lot of nice, nicer modern fonts also have special ligatured swords, but but it's nothing compared to compared to this Gutenberg stuff. This is much much more complex. Now there are other cases that are that are even more puzzling. We really don't know, you know, with with these kinds of constructions, uh, you know, how many how many types there are. If you don't get a, an obvious clue. Like the D, like the, the the ligature D hanging out on its own, then you really have no way of knowing you know ab initio how many how many how many sorts these these kinds of things are. So these are some of the complexities that Paul and Janet were struggling with in the 80s when they were trying to make their synopsis. Okay, so we we don't here of course the que it occurs to us to ask the question how many how many <coughs> sorts how many types are these things. Uh, because they're, they're multiple letters, and we think about letters as being the, the unit of signification, the unit of meaning in, uh, in, in printing. It never occurs to us to ask, in these cases, how many types there are. We assume that it's just one, because all of these are N's, M's, U's, and W's, and H's. Or actually, that, the thing on the bottom is, is not an H. That's a bit more complicated. Um, so here we just think, we, we assume that these things are going to be one, one letter, and that's what, what Paul and Janet did. But in fact, uh, even that assumption isn't really safe, that a single letter is going to, is going to have a one-to-one -one relationship with one piece of type. I'll show you what I mean. Um, this, is a sh okay, so this is a close-up again of the Sibylline book. I bring it up just because I'm now going to introduce another piece of printing uh, from 1462, a few years later. This is a bloodletting calendar from Vienna. Uh, it's a calendar that gives you the, the, the different um, times of the month and times of day to let blood in order to relieve impotence and other, other things like that. And it survives only in a single copy. Um, it's also in the Shady Library. 
it's not printed by Gutenberg, but it's, it's also one of the very earliest printers, and a lot of the typographic features are very similar to that earliest printing. This one does have, uh, have no current source, for example. It's, it's clearly a very primitive piece of typography. Okay, so um, this, is, this is what the printing looks like close up. You see that it's, it's quite similar in many respects to the Sibylle Mook printing. There are, there are um, 1, 2, 3, 4, 12, 13, 14 occurrences of the letter W in the Vienna calendar. And this is one of the things that kind of popped out at me when I first looked at this thing. The W's all look like, they're, uh, like they consist of, an, of, of something like an I and a V, two different pieces. And so I got kind of excited when I found this, and I went to, I went to Paul excited with, with, with this, with this you know, seeming result. And uh, he, he put me in my place. <laughs> I, since I'm not an early book scholar, he said, well, look, this, this type was used to print, to print a Latin book two years earlier. That was what it was designed for. And Latin has no W's in it, so this is obviously just a hack in order to create W's out of, uh, out of sorts that they already had in the, in the, in the type case. Okay, so I have this illusion. Um, but then I went, back to the, um, I went back to the Vienna calendar, and I started, I started to do some analysis of other letters. And uh, here's, here's one of the results of that analysis. This is, uh, this is a, a, a sampling, a random sampling of Ns from the Vienna calendar. And I've aligned them on the left-hand bar of the N. So one of the things to notice here is that it's, I mean, you can, you can, do, you can actually do, a, 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 do something more formal by, by looking at the, the vector that connects the center to the left to the center to the right and, and doing some, some statistics and so on. You can actually see it pretty clearly just by, by doing this. The left and the right-hand sides of the N uh, move relative to each other. It's pretty clear. Uh, they're not, this, this doesn't appear to have been a single, a single piece of type or single, a single typographic unit. And it's an N. Um, you know, by, in any language, this is one letter. So, so things started to get a little bit stranger, uh, and uh, and, and if, when you, the deeper you start looking into the into the into the typography, the more of this disturbing stuff you start to find of things that that, that looked like uh, like they ought to be single letters but didn't appear to be single letters in the sense that the different elements within that letter seem to move independently of each other as you as you go from one occurrence to the next. So, um, so at this point, I I decided to try it simplifying the whole problem of finding the synopsis of the Callistus bull uh, and attacking a kind of toy version of that problem first. Um, now, I, I'll just take a, a second aside to point out that this, this whole business about the ends apparently consisting of, of more than one piece of type, this, um, this is actually kind of epistemological. It's not, it's not just a technical thing. Uh, I, I kind of suspect that it may have to do with the way um, the way Europeans from this period, and uh, maybe especially Germans because of the way they wrote, thought about, about the whole concept of letter. We think about the letter as being the atom of, uh, um, of writing, but uh, they, they may have thought about minims as being the atoms of writing, which are these staves. Okay, this is the word minim, but you can only tell when you put the decorations on top. Uh, this, you know, they're, very, they're very subtle things that connect the, uh, the, the minims together into, into letters, and, uh, and the, whole, the whole training of a scribe was all about uh, creating that rhythm using minims. Is there any evidence in the, the, those there about whether those are in fact uh, individual sorts or multiple punches on creating a composite? Of course. Well, so this, was, this, was the, I mean, this is obviously the, you know, one, of the, one of the big questions, right? You know, what, so we, we, we suddenly got confused about what the basic unit is, and if we understand the basic unit, is that basic unit a punch we're talking about, or is it a piece of lead? Is it a single type, or what? Now, um, if you see them moving like that, then under the assumption that you're, using, uh, that you're using ordinary punch matrix technology, you really would have to conclude that they're separate pieces of lead all the way down to the bottom, because, because once, even, even if there are separate punches, once you, once you strike the matrix, there's no reason to restrike the matrix for every letter. It's, it's ridiculous. And you, you, in fact, only have a limited number of matrices you can strike with a punch, whereas you can cast a very, very large number of types from that matrix. So, you know, even if you've misaligned it a little bit, well, you know, you, you can now make, make uh, you know, a zillion uh, identically misaligned impressions of that letter. So. Uh, okay, so this is the kind of, you know, possible, possible idea that maybe, maybe people thought about bars instead of letters as being the atoms of, uh, atoms of, of, of signification. That's, that's something that we'll maybe return to very briefly at the end. I, I have a couple of points to make about that. But anyway, the, so this led to a toy problem in the Callistus Bull. 
uh, because I was starting to really feel unsure of my footing, you know, about what, what should be considered the, the atom here, what are we clustering. So I decided to try a toy problem, which is to cluster all of the I's, all of the lowercase I's in the Callistus bowl. Let's, let's at least find the synopsis of, of all of the I's that Gutenberg used. That seemed like a, um, like, like a pretty well-defined thing, because the I is clearly not going to consist of more than one piece of type. It's a single minimum. And it has the additional advantage that, that, you, um, that you have both the I and the dot. And you can do interesting things, uh, given that you have two connected components that you can, that you can sort of cluster independently. It gives you a validation. Uh, now, it's not as trivial a problem as it sounds, of course, because in, in, even the, this is from the 88 synopsis that, that Paul and Janet made. They already identified 12 different kinds of I. Uh, of lowercase i in the Callistus bull. This is their this is their synopsis, their identification of the types of i. So the question was basically, could I reproduce this? You know, if I if I try to clusterize, will I get something like this? Okay, so here's here's some of the process. Uh, the the i is about is about 200 pixels high, so it's it's quite a quite a substantial image. Um, there's there's the whole problem of of uh, um, finding a, a distance metric between different eyes, and of course there are lots and lots of approaches you can use to do that. I'm I'm sure you're familiar with many of those things like a, like um, uh, Fourier Fourier modes. You can do you can do kind of Fourier measurements that, that are invariant to rotation and translation. They turn out not to be good enough in this case. Um, the problem basically is that you can have slight slight rotations, uh, slight changes in scale, and so on. Uh, between different eyes on the page just because of the photographic technique. And you want a reliable way of, of deciding how far away two eyes are from each other. Um, so uh, I'll, 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 just, I'll just give you a, a taste of, how, of how, I, how I went about solving this problem. Uh, first of all, working in outline space uh, doesn't, uh, uh, or that is to say, you, you vectorizing the outline and, and looking at the differences between vectorized outlines is a, a much harder problem than it sounds. Uh, because because of the problem of distance, uh, if you um, well, I, I don't want to get too deeply into this because that's a whole talk on its own. But but um, there, there's a problem with parametrizing edges and then and then and then measuring uh, the dis the difference between two parametrized boundaries because of uh, because of the, the way you parameter because the the, act the the exact form of that function depends very strongly on on the speed with which you parametrize, and that can change depending on exactly how the thing got imaged, or, or, or slight details of how fuzzy the image was at that, at that point. So it's better to work in pixel space. And uh, so the, the approach that I ended up taking to this was uh, to start off with those original connected components. I'm showing it here at half resolution so you can see exactly what's happening. Uh, you you upsample that, and then you threshold. Then you downsample again. Okay, this is kind of an interesting trick. Because what it does is to eliminate all of the variation in the interior of the letter, so you don't worry about about variations in, ink, in inking, but you have a, a perfectly anti-aliased representation of the edge. So you have a, a, a nice, a nice kind of hyperacuity representation of the edge that takes into account all of the original kinks using using grayscales. And if you use isotropic filters to do all of this stuff, meaning direction invariant, then uh, then you can you can make the results. Um, be invariant under rotations. Uh, then you use an edge operator to uh, to get uh, to get the, the gradient along the edges. And so this thing, uh, once you've once you've optimized for uh, um, once you've done a local optimization for position and orientation, uh, gives you a very good vector to evaluate uh, differences between types with. So um, I run all kinds of tests with this with this algorithm to you know to make sure that if you generate data artificially that are that are slightly rotated and so on, you get exactly the right distance metric. It's, a, it's, a, it's actually a rather, it's, it's a very precise, a very precise measurement. It's very good. It's, it's better than anything else I was able to find in the, in the literature. Okay, so once you have a distance metric, then you can do things like hierarchical clustering. And here I'm showing you a small example of that. This is all of the, all of the bows or the dots on top of the eyes on the first two pages of the Calixtus bull. And, and here they've been organized into a, uh, into a tree by hierarchical clustering. So the, the root of that tree, I'm superimposing all of the dots, and then we're, and then we're splitting uh, based, on, based on, the, on dissimilarity. And the leaves, uh, so in, in the leaves in this tree, I'm showing both, the, uh, both the, the prototype in black and in gray all of the actual dots, all of the actual bows that fall within that cluster, if that makes sense. Please, please, uh, please stop me if any of this is... is uh, is not making sense, or if I should clarify. So these trees are, are, are pretty fun to, to play with. 
here's a here's a slightly bigger one. This is from the first five pages. So um, this part that I've highlighted on the bottom is uh, all of the all of the bows that are actually over bars, and they they came out nicely clustered together, as you'd expect. Um, now it's interesting because uh, in in the in Paul and Janet's synopsis from 1988, there were three eyes identified with over bars on them, and and over here in this uh, in in this hierarchical clustering, which which is is cross validated in a way that in a way that that tries to guarantee that the that it, that it doesn't split any more than it needs to, uh, we already identify nine different types. Now, it's. This, you know, these kind of clustering questions are very, very tricky to, you know, to, to really decide when to stop breaking up the tree, when, when the clusters are representative of a real group, uh, you know, whether, they should, whether, whether some of these maybe should be collapsed into a, back into their parent or not. Um, and there are lots of different validation techniques to try and, to try and decide uh, whether, whether a split is, is valid or should, or should or shouldn't be made. Uh, but, but here, even if you're rather conservative, you, you see that there are there are a variety of different types of, of overbars, and and these come only from the first five pages. So, um, and then of course the whole rest of the tree is is, is non overbar type bows, and uh, and you can see there are really quite a few varieties of those things ended up coming out of this clustering, a very large number, it's a shockingly large number. So, after going through all of the all of the pages of the Calixtus bowl, this is. Um, this is what the, what the most stringent kind of validation algorithm that I that I uh, that I applied came up with as the the archetypes and the elements inside them. So archetypes on the left, and all of the individual overbars that formed that archetype on the right. All singletons have been pruned, meaning that everything every everything that that didn't have a, a partner that was very close to it has been taken out. So th this only represents about forty percent of the I overbars in that uh, in, in the Callistus bowl, and um, so. Even even by I, I mean you you might argue, for example, that those first four archetypes really should be a single cluster, and this and the and then the three that follow should be a single cluster, and uh, maybe the fourth and fifth from the bottom should be a single cluster. That's still you still end up with seven seven archetypes, even if you even if you do the most conservative thing you can imagine, and that and that that really only takes into account a small fraction of the I overbars. So it's there's a lot more than three different kinds of overbars here. And, and the same is uh, the same is true, of course, of the of the of the bows. This is 96 out of the 300 or so I bow clusters that came out of this very conservative approach. And you can see that the differences in shapes are pretty are, are pretty substantial. And the, the, the message to take away here is that the differences among the, between the different clusters can be can be quite substantial, quite large. And yet, within that cluster, that that impression is quite reproducible. This isn't uh, this isn't stuff that emerges from printing noise from the, from the fact that when you when you reuse the type, it, it doesn't come out the same way. Uh, it, it's actually quite reproducible once you take into account all these other all, uh, all these other corrections, and um, and yet the, the eyes are the eye dots are all very different from each other. Uh, the same is true of the of the eye bodies, uh, and and here you have a few cases that really that really kind of. Uh, Validate the thing. Like you'll notice, there there, there are two uh, two eye bodies that have little notches in them, and so that does look like they might have been damaged single types, and they've come out very nice and cleanly in their own clusters. Um, and of course, the the ultimate test is to take the bodies and the the bodies and the dots, you cluster them independently like this, and you validate by uh, by seeing whether they co-cluster together, what the mutual information is between the clustering of the dots and the bodies. And I, I did all that stuff, and uh, and the, the the match turns out to be excellent. So. Um, and, and we, uh, I just thought I'd just point out that we do know that the body and the dot of the eye are on the same piece of type because uh, at least once in the Calixtus bowl we find this happening. This is this is the word singulis, and that that first eye has been set upside down. Okay, so obviously that can't happen if if the dot and the, and the body aren't aren't on the same piece of type. Um, so the bottom line is the algorithm comes up with tons of of different uh, of different seemingly unique. Uh, bodies and dots, and they co-cluster together, so they're real clusters. Uh, the, so at this point, I, I started to really worry because, um, well, one one possibility, of course, is that the algorithm is finding individual pieces of lead that are reused throughout the document, and that all the noise comes about in the casting process. Uh, but that now, once once that once that that unique eye has been cast and it, it's reused, you can the algorithm is good enough to identify all of the all of the instances of, of reuse. That would be really, really cool, but but it still leaves us with the question of well, how many real eyes are there? How many eyes, eye punches? I don't want to know the number of types in your type case necessarily, but what are the punches? 
So what's the relationship between those clusters and the actual punches? Okay, now, just to, uh, I just wanted to point out that, that all of those uh, I, I sorts that we were looking at over here correspond to only two um, uh, archetypes in that 88 synopsis. So obviously this is a much, much fewer uh, um, archetypes than, than come out of this clustering analysis, out of this, out of this, this automated analysis. Okay, so I, I'm not going to go through this stuff in detail. I just wanted to show you some of the co-clusterings there. Uh, the results are actually very strong. I've, I've colored them here in a way that shows all the errors very clearly. But the errors are, you know, sort of one or two mismatches compared to a large number of matches between, um, between cluster types. Um, and this second one, by the way, is, is, a, is, a, is a, a more modern piece of printing. Uh, modern meaning from the, from the beginning of the 16th century. And here you, you, stop, getting, uh, you stop getting that co-clustering. It, it more or less goes away. Uh, the only co-clustering that's left comes from the fact that there are, a, there are a subset of eyes that don't have dots on them at all. They're for ligatured sorts. Though that's, what that, that's what that one red dot on the bottom left is all about. And, um, uh, and, and the rest of the mutual information virtually disappears. So it's, it's, it's a very strong, very strong result. So, um, okay, so now I'll show you one more, one more um, interesting thing. This is from B36, the 36-line Bible. I, I mentioned it at the very beginning of the talk. Uh, it's much rarer than the 42-line Bible. It was printed in Bamberg, uh, probably after Gutenberg's death. But it was printed, interestingly, using the DK type, using, using Gutenberg's first type, which had somehow made its way to, to Bamberg. Um, and it was, it was, in fact, set from the 42-line Bible. Uh, there are some interesting errors in the typography that prove that. It's a very, very beautiful bibliographical proof. Uh, I'm going to focus on those hyphens um, that, that dangle off the right-hand side of the columns in B36. The Shady Library also has a copy of B36, and that's, that's of course, a huge sample set. Uh, you'll remember the, the, the um, kind of analysis that I did on the Vienna calendar, the ends, the two halves that move. Well, this is the hyphens, and, and now I'm aligning on the top bar of the hyphen. And this is, again, a random sampling. Okay, so the thing to notice here is that the top and bottom bars of the hyphen appear to move independently, too just like the left, the left and right halves of the end do. And this is probably the most, the most graphic, the most, um, the most obvious kind of visual proof that I've, that I've been able to find of, what, of, of the, the thing that's strange about these early types. Um, now, here, of course, it's, it's, it's impossible for those things to be separate pieces of type. I mean, they're, they're on a diagonal, they're on top of each other. It makes absolutely no sense for those things to, to be separate pieces of lead. That, that wouldn't make, make any, any sense typographically at all. Uh, and yet we're finding that, uh, that all these different hyphens, they, they look almost hand-drawn. They look as if, as if the top and bottom stroke have been, have been drawn, and there's a lot of noise in, in, in their exact placement and how much space there is between them. And that can't be noise, and you can't, uh, you can't damage a type in such a way that you move the two bars of the hyphen closer together or further apart. Uh, it's just, it kind of defies, defies common sense. Um, so uh, this and the other evidence kind of, conspires to, um, to give you the, the, the you know, very, very strong suggestion that these types appear to all be unique. Um, they're reused, so uh, there is, still, there is still, still reuse of type throughout the document, but there isn't, a, there isn't an archetype. There actually isn't a font. Every, every letter that's, that's made and reused throughout the document is, is handcrafted individually. There isn't a punch. Um, or at least there isn't, there isn't anything like a single punch that's been used to make the molds for all of those letters. Could you run through that sequence for more? Sure. Time? Let me run a little bit more slowly. So you see all kinds of differences. I mean, sometimes you see that one bar is more strongly impressed than the other one. So they, they, they appear to be slightly different depths. Sometimes the angle changes, like this one you can see is quite a different angle. With variations in the, the overall hyphen, whether this is a, a way to adjust to, to get variable width sets. Oh, I understand. Uh, no, uh, you can see you can see that it's not by looking at the way the hyphens are used. They're, 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 got a, they're hanging in. The they're, they're hanging. That's right. They're hanging off the right. So so these these aren't used as a. Um, uh, they're they're not well, used on the inside. Presumably, the way this is done is there's there's a there's an M set all along 
on all of these and then it's replaced? Could be. Uh, I mean, of course, it's not, it's not, not known, but that would be one way to do it. Um, yeah. that, that's the obvious way to do it. Yeah, I, I don't know if there's any other option. Right. Uh, it's, it's kind of a nice typographic trick, actually. I, I, wish, I wish hyphens worked like this more often. I think it looks, looks quite pretty. Um, but anyway, there, there, are certainly, there are certainly lots and lots of different, ty different hyphens that are, that are totally, totally distinct in, in, their, uh, uh, in their casting. Okay, so, uh, so now, I'll, now I'll give you my, my explanation of what's happening here, because the, so far I've just raised a bunch of questions and, and haven't really provided much in the way of answers. Um, so in order to do this last bit of analysis, um, I, I, I did something that I wouldn't have been able to do in any other rare books library on Earth, probably, which, which is what you're looking at here. Uh, this is B36, that, that horrendously rare book, and um, I, I set up a tinfoil reflector <laughs> underneath it and, and uh, um, mounted on top of plexiglass. And um, what I'm doing is shining, shining a bright light off the tinfoil reflector and through the page, so I get some transmissive, uh, transmissive lighting of these pages. It's something that's, that's ordinarily not very easy to do, to produce bright light going through the, through the page of a, of a, of a book in a, in a heavy binding and still treat the book nicely. Um, so we spent a lot of work rigging this, this bizarre thing together to do this. And uh, these are the kind of images that you, that you get out. So they have the downside, of course, that you, you can see both the back and the front uh, printing at the same time. Um, but the upside is that you can see now in, in great detail the structure inside the ink, which is, uh, which is stuff that we, um, that we ignored explicitly in the previous analysis. I wanted to start to look at the structure inside the ink, and I'll show you exactly why in a moment. So um, I'm, what I'm going to show you now are, are um, a few close-ups from the first page only of the Calixtus Bull. I want to convince you that, that, I'm not, that I haven't picked you know, a, bunch of, a bunch of very non-representative, strange, strange images from throughout a large document. These, these things occur absolutely all over the place. I'm just trying to give you a few representative pictures to show you what I mean. OK, so um, I, ho I hope the image quality is, is good enough for you to see this. Um, in fact, let's, let's, let's go to the, the next. This might be a little bit clearer. There are shapes inside these letters. There, there are sort of quarks inside the atoms of the letters. And um, so here, for example, you can see a diamond that, uh, that goes inside here, too. A diamond that actually goes inside the letter. In fact, here as well. Right, the, the, the vertical bar pokes through the bottom. And there's another piece that's been tacked on over here. Um, the, the S also has this feature. This is a square. This, this always feels a little bit like, look, like a, trying, to, trying to point out faces on Mars or something. But, um, I, I don't know if the image is as clear up there on the screen as it is on, on, on my screen over here. Uh, okay, this is a particularly telling example. So these are, these are two Fs that I can oscillate between. In both cases, you can see that the horizontal bar going through the F appears to go all the way through. You can actually see the bar going all the way through the F. And yet these Fs are, 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 are distinct, because look at the top of the Fs. Right? You see that they're totally different tops of the F. In fact, they're totally different in an interesting way. You can see that this F actually looks like the previous F with, with an extra bit tacked on. You can see the outline of that extra bit, and you can see the outline of the previous F as well. Do you see this? So these kind of, these kind of elements within the letters are a really strange thing. Uh, here's another so look at the, the, bottom, the bottom of the A. You can see this in a lot of the feet of the letters. You see. So the reason this is so strange is because if you use a punch to uh, strike a matrix and you then cast from the matrix, you never expect this kind of artifact because remember that you've carved away the negative space. So you start off with a perfectly flat steel face. It's been polished absolutely smooth. And then you've cut away the negative space. But the part you print from is the, is, is the original totally polished surface. So that's the part you strike into the matrix, and that's the part that forms the printing face of the, of the letters. So you never expect to see any kind of structure in the interior of the, of the printed letter. Uh, if there is any structure, it should be random. It shouldn't in any way echo the outlines of the, uh, of, of the letters the way, these, the way these structures do. So what, what the hell happened here? Uh, we, Paul and I called this um, cuneiform typography. Uh, because, of, because of similar kinds of, of properties that you see in, in cuneiform tablets, where you have reeds that are impressed into clay in order to form, uh, in order to form letters by, by, by pressing things in one after the other. Um, we called it that because, um, because the, the, the theory that we came up with to account for all these different observations 
is that Gutenberg used a form of casting that's, that's very ancient, um, either, either sand casting or clay casting. And the way these kinds of methods work is that you start off with a, with a very fine sand or clay surface, and you create the mold in it in one way or another. Um, but it's a soft surface, so you can create the mold in many different ways. And then you cast from that mold, but it's, it's, it's a, a mold that, uh, that can only be used to cast one or two uh, pieces of metal. It, it breaks apart or it effaces. Every time you, you pull something out, there's a very high chance that you'll destroy the mold in the process. So if you're making something like, a, like, like letters, you have to reform that mold many times. And it's almost as if every letter is, is, is really unique, is, is a unique creation depending on the way you, you, what you pushed in. Now, of course, if, if, you'd, if you'd actually made a steel, something like a steel punch, like a real archetype of every letter, uh, and use that every time, then we'd still have a, a great deal of consistency between letters. But it looks like he didn't use anything like a steel punch, but instead he made these impressions in the temporary matrix using, using these things that, we, that we're calling elements, uh, using some smaller thing. Uh, I, I don't know what those things might have looked like. They might have been some kind of wooden tools that made, that made diamonds or lozenges, other kinds of shapes. It's really sort of like drawing or like calligraphy. Yeah, I, I would thought that, you know, in that time frame of Gutenberg, uh, there was a lot of... Uh, and calligraphed, that, that was the basic method of writing books of prior to that. Yes. And if you're actually got a, a broad edge pen, this is exactly the way when you actually it, build up the strokes, you're exactly. actually doing that, those, those strokes. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Uh, I mean, this, this, is, this, is a, this whole style of writing, this whole look is based on, on, on calligraphic strokes. And the, the really interesting thing is that it looks like his letters, which were assumed to have been made in that modern way where you, 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 you carve out a steel punch, were actually drawn calligraphically also. I would have expected so for his first Bible. That's right. That's right. Uh, so, uh, and one of the consequences of that, of course, is that there is no font. This whole exercise of trying to reconstruct the font is, is a, a kind of a folly because every, every letter is a, is a unique hand-drawn thing. They're, they're reused, certainly, so it's as if you handcraft them all, you make the page, and then you can rearrange those letters to make a new page, but they're all different. What is the test of this hypothesis would be the strokes don't appear in the same order? Ah, okay, yes. So, uh, one, of the, so one, of the outstanding, uh, uh, one of the outstanding projects here to, to, to really finish this work properly and to get our monograph out on it, which will happen one of these years, is, is to, to really try and... and uh, and figure out the precise structure of the strokes in all cases, to, you know, and then to, to do some kind of, uh, you know, serious analysis to prove that it's not a face on Mars type thing. Right? Those or structures are always there. Visual system help you out? It, well, I hope so. <laughs> and and so certainly you can see a lot of consistency in the way those strokes are made. But uh, yes. Yes. You actually do follow exactly exact rules. Yeah, you do. You follow rules. Stroke one, two, three, four. How you build it up. It's not like handwriting at all. Right. Like right. Exactly. And of so, course, the fact you're drawing all the letters individually and so on, you know, it reinforces those kind of rigid rules. And and it does look. I mean, every every clear example that I've found where you can make out the the outlines of those of those you know quarks or elements, uh, you you can see uh, you know a great deal of consistency in how those strokes are made, but. I, I don't want to pretend that we've we've you know we've done a complete catalog and analysis of that yet. We haven't. That's that's still that's still an open an open problem. Um, and I, I don't think that it was exact that it followed exactly the calligraphic principles, by the way, because the, obviously the instruments were a bit different. They they seem to me very clearly to have been inspired by that, but but the uh, the way the strokes were constructed might have been a little bit different uh, because of because of the difference in in the uh, well the difference in the, in the tool that you're using. Um, now, I, so just, I just wanted to point out a couple of other little circumstantial pieces of evidence that, that, that also point very strongly to this. Uh, there are lots of quirks. Uh, I'm, I'm drawing now, again, only from that first page of the Calixtus Bulls. These are not, not, uh, not unusual things. Notice that bump on the inside of the, of, the, um, of the loop of the A. That's the kind of thing that you, you would certainly never expect to occur, unless it's just ink noise, of course. But you don't expect this kind of thing to occur in something that's, uh, that's been carved out of steel because when you carve away that negative space in the loop, that has nothing to do with the outline of the bar on the left-hand side of the A. That's the fact that that bar appears to poke into the loop is exactly the kind of artifact that you would never expect to appear in something that was, that was uh, cut with a punch. And yet you find those kind of things all the time. Over here, for example, you see that the loop and the, lo and the, and the, and the lozenge don't, don't seem to quite line up. Here's another case where you can see that the loop and the lozenge don't line up in a different way. You see the, the, uh, the lozenge looks like it was placed a little bit too high or at the, at the wrong angle relative to the loop. 
Here's a more extreme example from the next page. You can see, you know, these, these are the kinds of things that, I mean, if you design the type, you want the top arc of VA to be smooth. You, you, don't, you, you certainly wouldn't, wouldn't design this in if you were, if you were making a, a different punch. This is another, another very nice example from, from the B42, from the 42-line Bible. It also, I think, really shows that the 42-line Bible is printed using the same, using types that were made in the same way. This is the PER sort that we encountered at the beginning of the talk, and its design uh, requires that the bar on the bottom be flush with the bottom of the letter. Uh, so there are 207 instances of this PER, or I should, I should say 213 instances of this PER in the 70-page sample that I analyzed, uh, except six of them look like, look like the ones on the bottom, and those six recur uh, you know, regularly in, in such a way to suggest that we're looking at, 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 six, printing, at six impressions of the same exact uh, piece of type. And it's, it's you know, damaged in a very interesting way. You see the bar actually crosses. The, the vertical stroke. Again, this is not something that's going to come out uh, if, you, if, you're, if you're carving away the negative space. Clearly, just that bar was, was impressed a little bit too high. So, so there's a, a lot of circumstantial evidence that really points in this direction. Um, okay, I don't want to draw, this, draw, the, draw the ending out here, but all the, all, there, there are all these Dutch claims that the Dutch had invented printing um, b uh, slightly before Gutenberg. Uh, I, I don't think those claims are well substantiated at all, but, but just for the record, uh, the Dutch printing uh, from uh, that earliest Dutch printing also seems to show the same kinds of symptoms. And here I'm just showing you a close-up where you can see lots of variations in these uses, those things that look like nines. Um, right, lots of those kind of same kinds of variations. They're not, they're not consistent letters in, in the way that later printing, later printing characters would be. This is another really bizarre object. And this, this kind of thing makes me really wonder why this hasn't been questioned more, this, this kind of conventional picture of type making. This is a, a, a single leaf that survives in the Morgan Library in New York of the Constance Breviary printed sometime before 1473. And it's really a bizarre thing. I mean, that you can see that the printing is so irregular, the differences between the characters are so great, I have no idea how somebody could believe that this thing was made using a font. Uh, it, it looks, it, I mean, it's so bad that it, it, has, a, it has about two different sizes of, uh, of, of type in it, and sometimes you can't even tell whether a letter comes from the one size or the other size. It's, it's very crude. Uh, printing was, was actually temporarily outlawed in, in, in Constance. Um, by, by, the local, um, by the local priest shortly after this. I think it has to do with the very poor quality of this, uh, uh, of this particular object. <laughs> um, didn't look promising as a replacement for, for scribal work. So, um, yeah, here's, here's just another close up. You can see this, these rooms. That's lorum and multorum. Um, did, I, did I outline them? No, I'm talking about those things that look like fours. You can just see that they're just very, very different. There's no, no way that those things can be. I just love showing close-ups of this thing. This is so biz such a bizarre object. So this was obviously not a craftsman of, of Gutenberg's caliber. Um, and so you get a lot of this bizarre stuff. So, uh, well, that's, that's pretty much the, 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 end of the, the end of the talk. I just wanted to, uh, to give you a kind of brief postscript um, of, uh, to, to make good on, on at least a little bit of the promise that I gave you in the last paragraph of the abstract, which is um, about the whole process of, of, uh, um, of printing and how it evolved in that first 50 years, zoom out a little bit. Um, so a lot of the things that we've seen, they, they, they point to a, a, a kind of hybrid technology that, uh, that came in at the end of the, of the scribal period and the beginning of the printing period and doesn't really fall squarely in either camp in some sense. It's, a, it's somewhere in between. Uh, you, you write them almost scribally, you write the letters almost scribally, but then you print from them. Uh, so it's, it's really a, a kind of a, a transitory intermediate, intermediate technology, this, this romantic idea that Gutenberg had invented the whole thing, uh, you know, like, like Athena springing you know, full, full grown from, from the head of Zeus in the beginning. It's, it's just a romantic idea. It's not true. There was obviously a, a technological evolution in those first uh, 20 or 30 years. By the end of the 15th century, we know that the printing was happening in the conventional way. There's all kinds of evidence for that. But those first decades were decades of experimentation, of technological advance. And uh, something else very interesting happened in those decades, which is that the, the writing stopped looking like this, or like, or I, I guess I should go back to some nicer, nicer printing. It stopped looking like, um, like this, and started looking uh, like, um, for the most part, like, like uh, uh, what we think about as modern printing. It's based on, that, um, on, on those very nice uh, rounded lower cases and, and Roman upper cases. That's humanist typography. That really began in the same 50 years. And uh, one of the interesting things technically about the humanist, the humanist writing is that it has a much, much smaller character set. And it doesn't have letters that any longer depend 
uh, on, on um, what came before, what came after. We have a very few kind of you know, fossilized exceptions to those rules, like ligatures, or like the Spanish ñ, you know, the N with the tilde on top. That's, that was, of course, originally an, an NN. The, the bar on top is, is short for another N. And uh, that's, that's exactly like, these, like these, these, scribal, these Gutenberg scribal shorthands. So we have a few of those things left over. But, um, but they're just like these little fossil remnants of this, of this earlier tradition of very complex scribal writing in which the letters seem to have lost uh, some of their, of their individuality and this, their atomicity and instead to have uh, run together into this kind of uh, you know, forest of minims with, with shapes connecting them. It's less clustered. Um, I, I, really, I really believe, after having looked at a lot of this stuff, that, that people just thought differently about written communication before. Uh, before the, the advent of printing forced them to condense the character set into something well-defined and small and clear. The, and you can, you can see that you know, just, in, just in the size of the character sets as they, as they evolve from Gutenberg until 1500. They go from, um, from things that would certainly not fit in eight bits uh, down, to, uh, down to the usual 26 plus 26 letters, you know, give, or take, give or take a few. Um, and, and of course, one of the advantages of, of, uh, um, of printing using, uh, of, of making types using punch and matrix technology is that you make a big investment up front to, to uh, carve out the steel matrix, the steel punch. But once you've made that, it's very cheap and easy to cast lots and lots of copies of, the, of that identical letter. Uh, whereas, uh, whereas with Gutenberg's technology, it's interesting because there's a much smaller upfront cost to creating the image of every letter. But then, but then, of course, you don't have the consistency and you don't have the same ease of making lots of copies of that thing. Uh, so it's optimized for a different kind of, for a large character set in which the characters are reused less often. It's more like Chinese printing in that sense, which was invented a few centuries earlier, in which the character set is extremely large, uh, but, uh, and, and reuse of characters is less frequent. Uh, there's a different kind of cost-benefit cost analysis, if you will, behind, this, behind those things. And I, I believe that it was the, the emergence of the, of the punch and matrix technology that, that caused letters to move in that direction in the West, becoming you know, smaller, simpler, uh, um, simplified character sets. And uh, we're, we're really seeing some of the fallout from that now, I think, um, when, when we start trying to, um, to take other languages than the, the ones that use the, the Western alphabet. And... Um, and represent them digitally, which is kind of the same thing as, as printing. You try and condense them into a clear character set with clear rules uh, of composition of characters. We find that it turns out to be much, much more complicated uh, in languages that don't have a long printing tradition, uh, precisely because this, this, kind of, uh, um, this kind of evolutionary pressure just wasn't applied until now. And that's why we need 16 bits for Unicode. Uh, and, and, uh, and they won't fit in ASCII anymore if we try and, if we try and represent uh, you know, things like Arabic with all of its various uh, long strokes and dots and, and complicated hardware hanging off the, the alphabet. It's, it's just, I, I think that those are examples of languages in which that pressure wasn't applied. The alphabet never condensed down in the same way because, of, of the, uh, because it, they lack that 500-year history that we have of uh, being printed. So that's the end. Any, any, any last question? Well, that's great analysis. And are there any languages besides the Western alphabets that have been simplified by, by the end of the before, say, the 20th century? Korea? Yeah. So there's, the, there's the, the, the Hangul. And there's a whole set of uh, interesting. Have you, have you looked at the Korean typography? I have. Yeah. Uh, and that's it's especially interesting because. The mechanisms. The Korean typography, which, which you know, was invented in the, in the 14th century. Uh, all, it was also based on metal casting, unlike the Chinese printing from the, from the 12th century, I believe that's right. Um, and so it, it represented also quite an advanced state. I think that a lot of this emphasis on Gutenberg's intellectual contributions having been punch and matrix, it was made so specific in order to differentiate it from the Korean inventions. And with all this new evidence, you, know, it, I, I really, you, you start to really see a blur between what, what Gutenberg was doing, what the Koreans were doing. I've had a lot of, a lot of audiences ask me whether I think that there might have been any connection any direct connection, whether we might have learned about, about Korean printing and used that as uh, inspiration or, or just copied it. I, there's no evidence that that happened, but, but, um, but the timing is, very, is actually very close when you start to really look at it, so it seems to be not impossible. It's a very intriguing hypothesis. One of the things at a slightly larger scale, one of the reasons that you might have variations is to try to match the calligraphic thing where you 
are trying to squeeze or compress text yes. so that it lines up at reasonable places. Yes. Um, have you done anything about whether you can find correlations on, on per line, whether certain variations which are skinnier cluster together on one line? Well, I, I understand. You mean you mean whether whether sorts were actually selected on a line in order to get in, to get in more text for justification? Yeah. Uh, no, I, I haven't. It wouldn't surprise me if if master typesetters using these kind of methods did such things. But um, it's a very interesting question. I mean, of course, the whole the whole fact that there are ver you know, versions of the eye with and without spines, you know, it comes about in order to enforce that regular rhythm. Like you can see in the E I over here, this is AUS. This is an eye without spines because you want to move it close enough to the E to keep that vertical rhythm. So, so there are certainly certainly kind of mark of one. You know, there there are, there are neighbor correlations in order to do that. Uh, whether there are line correlations or not, uh, I. I haven't looked. I, I wouldn't be surprised if if if, uh, if a really good typesetter might have done stuff like that. Have, have you tested your hypothesis by checking to make sure there are not too many identical characters on any one page? Yes, of course. That's that's one of the one of the obvious tests. And yes, I know. Um, there is one case in which I did find uh, two characters, even char two characters with a distinctive kind of damage that really you know, says that this, this probably were cast from the same mold on the same page in one case. And when I first found that, I was really kind of in despair because I thought that must uh, disprove the whole idea. But um, it turns out that, that, uh, that, that, that you can sometimes cast more than one character from a temporary matrix, from a sand or, or, um, or clay matrix. It's, um, it's not exactly one character that has to come out. It's just a very small number, probably only one or two. So you, you, you do find them on, you do find uh, things that cluster together on the same page much much more rarely than you find them in, in that regular rhythm, the, the typesetting rhythm of, of four pages, eight pages, whatever it happened to be for that, that text. Uh, question. Uh, what I've seen in Sandcast about it's always been on things where you weren't trying to get such fine detail. Is there, sure. is there problems with getting sand that's fine enough? Let me uh, bring you back to a, a, a slide that I skipped over near the beginning of the talk. I was talking about the Dutch and the Germans and their kooky theories about, uh, about how type might have been made. But, yeah. uh, this is uh, an example of sand casting to make, uh, to, make a, uh, to make types, to make a tree of types. The way this worked was that you, uh, you, they used wooden, wooden punches to make the impressions of all the letters, and the wooden punches are shown on the top left, I think, or at the top right. I'm not sure. One of these is the wooden, one of these piles is wooden is wooden punches. You press them into the sand, and then you run channels in the sand so that you can pour the metal in one spot, and it will fill up all of the all of those uh, holes. And, and this tree of characters is, is, is what you get out. And so it's, the experiments have actually been done early in the century to try and make letters with sand casting, and it works. Um, also, those techniques were, we know were used to make very large initial capitals and other kinds of things, uh, you know, even in the well-documented history of printing in the you know, 17th, 18th centuries. So there's plenty of evidence of that kind of stuff. So it can be done. So you're basing this on the, uh, what you have in the plots, and the fine detail. I'm sorry, can you speak louder? <coughs> A lot of this is based on what you're getting from the ink plots when you're looking at the fine detail within the uh, letters. Yes. Um, although there is also that other, all, all the other circumstantial evidence. Yeah, I agree. Um, you, s you touched uh, briefly in the beginning of how you were able to get the impression of the uh, punch on the letter. Yes. On the, on the paper. One of the hopes, that method was actually, I actually developed that method after we'd come up with the whole cuneiform thing in the hope that I'd be able to see the three-dimensional structure. And have you been able to find any of that? Um, it's too noisy. I mean, I, I think that it, it might be possible to do with better with better hardware, but um, but not using the hardware that I was that I was using. It was too much um, too much camera noise, too much imaging noise. I was really pushing the camera to the limits in order to get these very small images um, at very high resolution and with and with a lot of of, of quantum efficiency you know, through the black ink and with bright light. I did I couldn't make the light very much brighter without starting to heat up the book too much and so. I was really just at, at certain kinds of limits. I'm sure that with more expensive, with more modern kind of hardware, I could, I could do better, but I didn't succeed. So I, you've given me this nice picture in my mind of the type caster, the sand in front of him, carefully building up the shape of a letter and casting a letter out of it, taking it out and looking in anticipation to see whether he can use it again. 
Right. Um, perhaps at that point he's going to say, well, that little bit's broken, I'll fix that. I'll fix it up a bit, right. Can you see anything where there's... Well, a it's, I think it's possible. And in fact, re remember the, the Fs. Um, you know, the Fs could be interpreted uh, to suggest something like that. Um, where is this? You know, these... You can think that you can you can imagine that this f was made out of the out of the hole you know that that this that that, that cast this f just with that with the tip the top tip cleaned up somehow it's not right. impossible. Right. Um, I mean I think I think it's probably more likely that they would just right. make another but this is all speculation. Right? It seems it seems it seems possible. Could there be any investigation about lost practice methods? Uh... Um, right. Again, so, you're looking for malleable punches. There is um. So there's a, a guy, uh, Stan Nelson, who, uh, who did the documentary with us. He's a, a, um, he's a, uh, he actually does this kind of stuff for real. He knows how to work metal and how to make types and so on. He works in the Smithsonian in DC. And uh, he, he did speculate about other kinds of possibilities like, like wax. And he, I, I, there are some elaborate hypotheses that he put forward as well involving you know, glass surfaces and so on. So it's certainly possible to speculate about more about refinements or variants on these kinds of methods. Uh, Paul and I are, you know, both feel about that kind of speculation that it's going to be really hard to 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 really prove anything conclusive about whether this or that vari you know, variant method was used. We don't even like to say sand or clay in front of a bibliographic audience. We <laughs> prefer to just say there were obviously temporary matrices, and those are, you know, some of the some of the obvious materials that temporary matrices were made from at the time, but. So we have pretty strong evidence, I think, that the matrices were temporary, that they were remade, but the details, you know, we, we really don't know. Um, one comic book, kind of going the other way, is that, that one cat you had uh, depicted a print shop from around 1500 really struck me how it looks virtually identical to, you know, Re reconstructions of print shops of the late 18th, 19th, early 19th century. Right. That's right. That's right. So that suggests that there may have been a lot of technological yeah. progress for the past, for the first 50 years, exactly. but after that, it was basically frozen for yeah, yeah. 300. Well, that's that's why that's why Gutenberg was named Man of the Millennium in 2000. You know, there's uh, certainly from 1500 to 1850, uh, the only very small details changed. Really, it was, it was just tremendously stable technology. Um, so they, they really got something that worked well for, you know, for, for many centuries. The, the question is how, how that was arrived at from, from the scribal tradition, you know, what happened in, that, in the beginning. All right, so is that it? Thank you. Thank you.